you want to open up with me to Acts chapter 2. Last week we were looking at Acts chapter 1 and we're going through the book of Acts looking at the Holy Spirit and, and when he's moved and uh, you know kind of trying to get an understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and, and what he does. We looked last, uh, last week as we were together at chapter 1 and we looked at how Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, and if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, you and I need the Holy yes, Spirit. Amen. We looked at if He needed the Holy Spirit for His ministry and for serving and accomplishing the purpose that God had for Him, the Father had for Him, that He, he had to have the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit was sent upon Him, and we looked at how you know, you and I, in order to receive the Holy Spirit, to be used by Him, to be saturated by Him, that we cannot be divided in and of ourselves, right? We can't be warring in ourselves, divided in our loyalties. We must be seeking God above all things. We can't be double-minded in the way that we're living our Christian life. We've got to be all in seeking Him and we look at how in the body of Christ we can't be divided amongst ourselves as brothers and sisters. That we want to be saturated with the power Amen. and the presence of the Amen. Holy Spirit. And we looked at what it was slightly, uh, very briefly on how there's a difference between influenced by the Holy Spirit, but then being driven, being led by the Holy Spirit. The, the, we, and then this week we're putting, picking up here in Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at the actual uh, event where the Holy Spirit, where He came and He empowered God's people. That same power, that same presence, that same spirit is available to you and I today. He, he that came there on the day of Pentecost, he is available to you and I today. Yes. When you accept him as Lord and Savior, he takes up residence. Yes. But there's so much more than that. having a house guest. He wants to be in control. He wants to be the one who's leading, guiding, directing. He wants to be the one that is the transforming power in each and every one of God's children. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 2 verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as, a mighty, uh, as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And, and there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the first thing that we need to look at here is, is that, that they were all together in one accord again, right? And I just want to briefly mention that. There's a reason why it says at the end of chapter 1 that they were in one accord in prayer and supplication, and then here again in chapter 2, they were in one accord. Days had gone by since they had entered the upper room, right? Days had gone by they, they, they were, while they were praying and seeking God, waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit that, that Jesus had promised them when he ascended. He told them to go and tarry in Jerusalem and wait, and that's what they did. They were in one accord. Let me stress again, if you want to be saturated, if I want to be saturated by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, then you and I must strive to not be divided. Amen. Right? We've got to be all in, 100%, seeking God with all that we have, and our decisions in our life. But we've got to be focusing on Him, honoring God. We can't be divided in our loyalty. Amen. Our loyalty has to be God, God alone. We cannot be attached to the world. We must forsake the attachments of, uh, to the world and focus upon Him. And we, if we wanted to operate in our churches and in the body itself, then we have got to be in unity. We cannot be in one accord. Or we cannot be divided. We must be in one accord. Amen. We can't be bitter and infighting and division and jealousies and envy and strife and anger and resentment. God cannot move in that. The Holy Spirit will not bless those attitudes. The Holy Spirit will not bless that behavior. So being in one accord, purpose of mind, purpose of vision, yeah. purpose uh, uh, of unity. I mean, just in, in one accord in mind and thought and in purpose. Amen. We're here, we're praying, we're seeking God for the promise. 
and more than we want to eat our next meal, and more than we want to drink our next drink, and more than we want to go back to our jobs, and more than we want to go back and do what we've been doing. We want to experience the promise of God, the power, and the might, the gift of the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit. One accord. And it says that there suddenly, in the midst of this prayer and supplication that they had been doing for however many days, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come, suddenly He shows up. And the Bible says that tongues appeared over every single person that was in that room, man or woman. If there was a child, it says every single person that was in the room, that a tongue of fire appeared over them and lit upon them. What that tells us is, is that the Holy Spirit is available to all of God's children, all of those that have called upon Him as Lord and Savior. There is no respecter of persons. He doesn't care about our talents, our abilities, our gifts. He doesn't care about our past. He doesn't care about what we used to be. He doesn't care about bad decisions. He doesn't care about any of the things that the world cares about. If you are a child of God, you are inherited the Holy Spirit. He is a seal upon you, according to the book of Ephesians, that lets the world know and lets you know that you belong to God. And so the Holy Spirit came upon all of them as a tongue of fire, denoting that there was none among them, including the 11 disciples, the original 11 apostles. They were greater than the others that were gathered in the room. Right? There were no levels of who got what. It wasn't like the uh, 15 tongues of fire sat down on Peter and the other people had to split the remaining ones among themselves. They all received an equal portion of the Holy Spirit in that room. Yes. So the idea that I'm not worthy, I don't deserve it, I'm not good enough, that uh, you don't know what I've done, you don't know where I've been, you don't know anything about me. That all goes by the wayside. It doesn't matter if you're a man, woman, boy, girl. It doesn't matter what you used to be. It is equal. I don't have any more access to the Holy Spirit than you have access Amen. to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus didn't have any more access Amen. to the Holy Spirit on earth than you have access to the Holy Amen. Spirit, right? He is there, pulled out, poured out in one measure, and it is available for everyone. Amen. He's there, and He's ready, and He is available to everyone. That flame of fire lit upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now what I find amazing here uh, is that uh, when they started speaking in these other tongues, the Bible tells us here, starting in verse 5, that everyone heard them speaking in their own language. And it also says there that when they were speaking and they heard them in, all the own, in their own language, they were, they were speaking the wonderful works of God, verse 4. I'm sorry, verse 11. The wonderful works of God, verse 11. They were speaking about God's miracles, speaking about the Messiah. They were all speaking about Jesus and His gift. They were all speaking the wonderful works of God, what Jesus had done, and the Father, and the promise of the Messiah. And listen, they were, un, they were not educated folks. Peter, Andrew, James, John, uneducated fishermen, right? There were ladies among them who were not respected as teachers. Come on. They weren't respected as religious teachers or leaders, right? They weren't supposed to be loud and vocal. But the Bible says that all of them began to speak in other tongues. Meaning they didn't have to go to any Bible classes. They didn't all of a sudden have to go study Greek theology or Greek, uh, 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 the, you know, Greek vocabulary. They didn't all have to go and study the languages of all the people that they were there present in the city. They didn't have to go memorize a bunch of scripture. Come on. What I'm saying is, is 
is that God took them at the point at where they were and he used them to do something Amen. mighty. Yes. They didn't have to go into some sort of, 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 of in-depth training to be able to present what God had them to present that day. Amen. Man, woman, boy, girl, the Holy Spirit came and was poured out upon them. And now in an instant, just like that, they were all preaching, speaking the wonderful works of God. And God, through a miraculous intervention, fixed it so that everyone there heard them in their own language and dialect. It had nothing to do with them. The only thing they offered was the willing vessel. The only thing they did was they were obedient and went in prayer and supplication and resided in Jerusalem until the promise came. Beyond that, they didn't know what was coming. They didn't know what was happening. Other than they were to wait. And when the Holy Spirit came and filled them and empowered them, when He saturated them, God was able to use them immediately. Right? immediately. We can't disqualify ourselves and believe that we cannot be used by God because we lack an education. We don't have our high school degree or we don't have a college education. We can't disqualify ourselves because maybe we have a, you know, there are people that disqualify themselves because they have a speech impediment. There are people who disqualify themselves because of, 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 of not being believing that they are qualified. But the only qualification that you and I need is the qualification of seeking God with all that is in us. Amen. And then allowing Him to use us. Amen. No qualification is necessary other than the fact that we are sealed. Amen. And that we are not divided in ourselves, our allegiance, our loyalty is to God and God alone. Amen. And the Holy Spirit came upon them and immediately they began to speak the wonderful works of God. And it was translated so that everyone around them could hear them in their own language. So if you feel this morning that you cannot be used by God, Acts chapter 2 tells us that you can be used by Amen. God. If you're here this morning and you feel like uh, you're not qualified, you're not gifted, you're not skilled enough to be used by God, uh, God used the uneducated to educate the wise. Amen. And God used the foolish to confound the wise. Yes. Uh, and you see what I'm saying? God used what man considered to be base and unusable. He used it to preach the wonderful works of God. Amen. They weren't relegated to a specific area or to a corner. God poured out His Spirit, man, woman, boy, girl, and they all prophesied together in one accord. They spoke in tongues and told of God's wonderful works. There wasn't anything else for them to do on their part. They said, be obedient and be available. Amen. So if you're here and you question whether God can use you, question whether you're gifted, question whether you're talented enough, or question that something in your past or even in your present disqualifies you. God wants you to know you are not disqualified. Amen. You simply need, need to uh, call upon him, seek him, make him number one, be obedient, yes. and pray and seek and ask. And then you'll look now with me to verse 14. In verse 14, Peter begins to preach a message. And I want to speak about the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. We live in a world of um, people trying to change themselves. We've got uh, uh, home over, you know, home that show extreme home over make makeover edition or whatever it was called. I used to watch it, where they take a piece of junk and they turn it into something beautiful. Mm -hmm. 
uh, trading spaces has come on where you take a junky room and they change it and try to make it something unique and beautiful, right? Uh, they've got, uh, you know, you see the, the bottle bodybuilding magazines and you see, see the before and after pics. Oh, here's what they were before, but here's what they, they turned into, right? These transformation. And uh, I remember years ago, someone said, hey, here's this book called Body for Life. Take a look at it. And when you look at it, you see all these before and after pics. And you're like, uh, how in the world did that person end up looking like that? I mean, literally, there was like a, a, a 70-year-old man who had a face and the head of a 70-year-old man, but his body looked like four. And I'm just going, how did, how did that happen, right? I mean, what, what happened with that, right? That there's this, that there's this, uh, this, this transformation from flabby grossness to all of a sudden pecs and abs and muscles and legs as big as tree trunks and you know what I'm talking about and they give you the easy steps to go from there, you know from point A to point B but they ain't all that easy right. oh you can be like this too if you eat 5,000 calories a day or 10,000 calories a day and protein and you work out 6 out of 10 hours and you know, you know all these things yes you can look like Mr. Universe too or you can look like you know whatever too we are enamored with transformation. The problem is, and I am guilty, as I look at my before and I look at the after of someone else, but I never quite make it to the after. <laughs> right? Many times I get stuck, not even in the middle. I don't even make it quite to the middle. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm maybe even a quarter into the whole thing. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I just I can't do this. We want transformation. We want things to change. We want to be different. That's why there's self-help programs and positive thinking programs and people who stand up and tell you, uh, give you strategies to cope with and be positive in your thinking. We've got a gentleman right now in our faith, uh, the Facebook group for our community, Leland Station, and he's took it upon himself to daily post a positive uh, teaching point, not from scripture, but Think positive. Don't speak negative words. Only speak positive things that slowly transform yourself. The transforming, though, that I'm talking about is the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. It can't happen through any amount of positive thinking. It doesn't happen through any, any amount of physical effort or mental effort. The power of the transforming power of the Holy Spirit happens simply because God is God. Yes. Amen. And the Holy Spirit is omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing, and everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right? That's the only the reason that it is capable of happening. The transforming power of the Holy Spirit takes someone who was dead and makes them alive. Amen. Right? Amen. Take someone that was dead, lost, spiritually separated from God, dead and lost, and, and, and unable to have a relationship with God, and then He comes on the scene, He transforms us, and He resurrects the dead. Amen. Not only does He take that which is dead and He makes it alive, He can take that which is broken and fix it. Yeah. He can take that which has been hurt and heal it. He can take that which is weak and make it strong. He can transform. Right? He can take something and that could, and, and, and the human aspect could never be anything more than what it is. Mm -hmm. And make it something completely different. Amen. The transforming power of the Holy Spirit. And there's no better example than Peter. Right? Peter is the perfect example of what the Holy Spirit can do in each one of us. Because Peter was a liar. Peter was arrogant. Peter was prideful. Right? Peter was a coward. Right? Peter ran. He hid. He, he denied Jesus. He always was all brash and excited and putting his foot in his mouth. Uh, but he, he was a, a messed up dude. Right? He went before the, power of the, the, the day of Pentecost, before he was transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't someone you would look up to. He kind of was the de facto leader of the 12 disciples because he was loud. He always had an opinion, whether it was good or bad. Right? They all, that's the truth. They didn't follow him because he had some great spiritual insight. They followed him because he was charismatic and he was loud. I mean, the man pulled Jesus to the side and told him he was lying. <laughs> you ain't going to die. 
Uh, you you aren't going to be uh, put to death. That ain't going to happen, right? He he was he was the guy who was always uh, opening up his mouth and asserting his foot when Jesus when they came to arrest him. He uh, instinctively pulled out his sword and cut off the dude's ear, the, the servant's ear. Why? Because uh, he had in his mind that Jesus was going to be king. He was going to overthrow the Roman government. And he was taking the first blood. Let me strike first. Right? He was not. He, he was so far off for the things that he had, like that God had revealed to him that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Right? Uh, for those one thing, he had 20 bad things. He was impetuous. He was someone that if he was in our churches today, we would look down upon. Uh, would you invite someone who denied Christ three times to come up and preach the next Sunday? <laughs> who in the media, on the CNN or Fox News, or gave an interview to WTOP or Washington Post and said, I don't even know who this Jesus is? Because that's what he did. In front of everybody, in front of crowds, in front of groups of people, three times he said, uh, I don't know this guy. Oh yeah, yeah you, I think, you think you saw me with him, but I, that wasn't me. You, you, you were making a mistake, right? Uh, I don't even know who he is. In fact, the Bible says that when Jesus did die, and even after he rose from the dead, Peter was so ashamed of himself that he went back to fishing. Him, James, John, they went back to fishing because they believed, and he specifically believed that they couldn't be used by God. Wow. It was done. It was over. Game over. They had rejected him. He had rejected him. He had, uh, you know, ran away. He had denied his Savior three times. The one he said, I die for you. The one he said, I fight for you. The one he said, I'll never let that happen to you. I'll never leave your side. He had denied and left and ran. And so he went back to what he was doing. Fishing. Because he believed himself disqualified from even being with Jesus any longer. He considered himself disqualified for being a part of the inner circle. He considered himself to be disqualified from ever doing anything for Christ again. He considered himself disqualified. Mm -hmm. He couldn't be used. He couldn't accomplish. He would never be a fisher of men again. He would never do what God had called him to do because he had rejected him. But then on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, something changed. He went from worried about everybody around, around him, Peter, worried about, uh, you know, feeling sorry for himself, Peter, self-pity, Peter. He went from uh, denying Christ, Peter, to all of a sudden standing up in front of the very people that he had denied Christ to and preaching about him. It wasn't a, a, a long process. The Holy Spirit fell and Peter changed. Amen. He was transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. He went from coward to brave. He went from weak to strong. He went from fisher fisherman to actual fisher of men. He finally went from what he was to what God had him to be. There was a great chasm, and the chasm was crossed when he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit transformed him from A to B. See, transformation isn't a, 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 a mutation. Transformation isn't a, a, a small change that happens. Transformation isn't adding some biblical knowledge to your brain. Isn't memorizing a few scriptures. Isn't expanding uh, your talents. Transformation is when you have one thing and it becomes something different. Yeah. Right? Transformation is when you have a caterpillar that becomes a butterfly. It was a caterpillar, then it becomes a butterfly. Transformation 
is when one thing becomes something completely different. It's not adding to, it's not increasing one's skill set, it's not, you know, increasing one's training or education. Transformation is not accomplished through any means that a human has. It is only accomplished by a supernatural touch of the Holy Spirit. And that's what happened, and Peter was immediately changed. Paul writes that we are to not be confirmed, conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That means the Holy Spirit changing us. Changing us. Changing us. No matter how many books you read, no matter how many self-help things that we go to, no matter how many resolutions we make to be better, uh, to change, to do something better with our lives, no matter how many times we make mental resolutions, that is not transformation. Transformation is when something goes from a resolution to something that is actually real. See, resolutions aren't real. Resolutions are promises based on man's own ability. Resolutions are things that are made or promises that are made based on what man can do. And that's why resolutions fail. They're not real. They have no substance to them. They're not based on any kind of foundation. But when it becomes real, that's the transforming power of the Holy Spirit who takes resolutions to their conclusion, which is real because it is based upon an almighty, all-powerful God. So that no matter what we were, that's not who we have to be. No matter what we went through, that doesn't define us. Why? Because the Holy Spirit changes the definition. We have a, a, a dictionary called Webster's. And in that dictionary, there are definitions for all kinds of words. As you grow up, as you've been taught to read, as I was taught to read, we were taught what the definition for go, the definition for cat, the definitions for all these words. Those are set in stone. But what the Holy Spirit does is He takes the world's definition and then He applies God's definition so that what the world defined one way, God defines another way. We go from the world's definition to God's definition. That's transformation. And that cannot be done in and of ourselves. God has to do that. The Holy Spirit has to do that. Had the Holy Spirit never been poured out on the day of Pentecost, Peter and those 11 disciples would have never been anything more than what they had always been. They proved that when they went back to fishing. If the Holy Spirit had not been poured out on the day of Pentecost, all those individuals who were gathered in the upper room, the 120 that were gathered, they would be the same when they died as they were when they were uh, in Jerusalem and they saw Him ascending. It wasn't the ascension of Christ that transformed them. It was the power of the Holy Spirit that transformed them. It wasn't the teaching of Christ that transformed that transformed them. It was the power of the Holy Spirit that transformed them. All of the seeds had been planted by Christ. The discipleship, the teaching, all of that had been planted. It was there, but there was no growth. When the Holy Spirit came, all of a sudden what had been planted was brought to life. All the parables, all the lessons, all the teaching, everything that Jesus said, all of a sudden that which was dormant sprang to life and it made sense. What they had been taught even by the Messiah, by God, while amazing, was not life changing until the Holy Spirit came. So even though people hear and they think Jesus was a good man, and he has some good things to say. Well, that's fantastic. I'm glad you think that he was a good man and he had some cool things to say. However, thinking, taking, going from thinking he was a good dude with good things to say to then being a believer, chasing him, and being transformed, that only comes through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And I know I'm harping and I'm saying it over and over again, but I want you to understand, I want trying to, to get through our minds that if you've always been the way that you've been, the one ingredient missing is the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Now, if, if, if I've always been what I've always been, I need to be transformed. And I need to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if I keep promising God I'm going to change, but I don't change, I need the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And if I keep promising God I'm going to do better, but I don't do better, I need the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. If I keep promising God I'm going to get out of this bad relationship, but I'm never able to break away from the relationship, I need the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. And if I keep promising God I'm going to give up pornography, but I can't give up pornography, I need the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. If I keep promising God, I'm going to give up uh, drugs and alcohol, but I can't give up drugs and alcohol, then I need the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. That's the key. That's what we are missing. The transforming power of the Holy Spirit, yeah. recognizing that no matter what I do with my flesh, without the Spirit, it cannot result in the change that God desires. No matter how much effort I put in, no matter how much I strive to be different and to be like Christ, I cannot be like Christ without the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. No matter what, I cannot be who God wants me to be without the Holy Spirit's transforming power. Taking me from what was to what should be. And there's no way to cross the chasm from what we are to what God wants us to be except the Holy Spirit. He's the bridge. Thank you for listening to this message. We hope that you enjoyed it and were blessed by it. Each month we have people from all over the world who listen to the messages made available. If you've been blessed by this ministry, would you consider making a donation of any amount to help support us as we continue to reach the loss for Christ? Donations can be made online at www.reviveoc.org or by check at Revive Outreach Church, 411 Chatham Heights Road, Suite 101, Fredericksburg, Virginia, 22405. Thank you for your prayers and your continued support. May God richly bless you. Bless you.